So year 10s, what you're looking at here is my last Duchess on OneNote. Um, let me just turn around and explain how this is going to be different. So earlier on today, I did some annotations of this poem, filming myself with this special snazzy camera that you see right there. Um, and I did these annotations. However, the sound ended up totally out of sync with the picture. So what I'm going to do is just kind of explore the poem a little bit and explain my annotations to you. So you've got one task to do to begin with, and then you can pause this film while you do it. So that task is, let me turn it around, um, is you need to go onto OneNote, and you need to find in the poetry section, um, My Last Duchess, there's the poem. Now, it might be a little bit complicated to some of you, um, but what I've done is underneath, I've downloaded from the internet a really useful kind of modern day translation that looks a little bit like this. Well, it looks exactly like this because this is it. Um, what I'd like you to do is just read this. Let me just focus on that. Read this. Um, carefully, even if you have to pause the, pause and read it on this screen, um, so that you understand how this modern language reflects the um, Victorian language. So I'm assuming that you've paused that. Good. And now, now you understand what's going on in the poem a little bit. Now for some language analysis, I'm going to race through this. I annotated it earlier. I've spent all day trying to get the video sorted and haven't managed it. So this is a bit of a shortcut. Never mind. You need to try to get your annotations as close to this or better as possible. You can put your own ideas down. That's welcome. But make sure that you're not skimping on this or putting lightweight annotations down. Detail is everything. So. Going to the beginning, we have, um, that's my last Duchess painted on the wall. Um, and so immediately we have, I'm going to just swap hands a minute. No, I will use this finger. Um, immediately we have this possessive pronoun, my, um, hinting at the status of the Duchess. She is somebody who is owned by the Duke. That's my last Duchess painted on the wall. Um, and remember, this is a power and conflict anthology. And this power for um, this poem comes from his class, his rank. Um, he has a, a dukedom and that gives him lots of financial influence and clout, but also um, patriarchal and masculine power throughout, which um, is reflected with his continual repetition of I and me and my. Um, so that's my last Duchess painted on the wall, he explains, looking as if she were alive. I call that piece a wonder now, he said. Um, I put a little box around that piece. That's because I think it's an ambiguous phrase. Um, most obviously referring to the painting. That piece is the painting. But also it refers to and dehumanises the Duchess because he goes on to say Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day and there she stands. So, you know, that she isn't named. There's no sort of um, sense of her here. It's just the sense of a painting. She is very captured in just oil, canvas, curtains and perhaps perhaps a decorative wooden frame. Um, well, will it please you to sit and look at her, I said. Uh, will it please you to sit and look at her? And this is interesting. I'm going to stop here because that little section there, um, there's a painting on the wall. Look at that beautiful piece of artwork. Please sit down and look at her. It's kind of almost reversed at the end. I'm going down to the end of the poem and that's why I've put this little star and this little bracket at the beginning and the end here. Um, because at the end he said, um, please, please will you rise, will you stand up? And then on the way out he notices another piece of artwork. So this is a man who obviously is a fan of art but also he is um, kind of dramatically framed the whole story. Nearly all of this is framed. Let me just focus on that. Nearly all of this is framed within um, the narrative device of sit down, look at the painting and stand up and look at this other piece of artwork on the way out. And both pieces of artwork freeze, if you like, a dominance over beauty. If you think of this paint this statue of Neptune taming a seahorse. You could rather think of that figuratively as like him, although he doesn't probably realise um, that that's what he's giving away to you readers, that 
he is taming beauty all the time. Um, and this is Neptune taming a seahorse. And it's captured and frozen in a cast bronze um, that moment forever. Just like the painting at the beginning, captured and frozen a moment of beauty. So this is significant. The Duke begins and ends his monologue with praise for his two artworks, but they betray his character. That's what dramatic monologues are all about, betraying who somebody, who the speaker really is. He is someone who likes captured beauty. It gives the Duke control over life with art. It gives him dominance over beauty. I've underlined control and dominance being two key themes of this poem. Um, so moving on, the name dropping, the um, aren't I important to have a painting by Fra Pandolf? I said Fra Pandolf by design. I definitely meant to drop his name in there. This is pretentious. This is somebody who is betraying his financial um, position rather than a genuine taste in art. This isn't somebody who definitely loves art for art's sake. This is somebody who has a sense of... Um, pretentiousness and wanting to impress with his material goods. Um, I said Friar Pandolf by design for never read strangers like you, that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance. So I've actually drawn a little picture here. I think it's always good to have a little picture somewhere on poetry annotations. This is um, my last Duchess, obviously, with a curtain either side of her so that he can conceal and reveal her whenever he likes. He can capture her smile there and it's his to do that with now. Anyway, the depth and passion of its earnest glance. Now, I'm not saying that that looks deep or full of passion, um, not as much as she really would have been. Um, but they may show flirtatiousness. Possibly that is going to be his meaning later on in the poem. But more likely, this depth and passion, passion here really refers to a passion for life, a passion for joy. Um, but anyway, these people, when they looked at this painting, um, since none puts by the curtain that I have drawn for you, he says. Um, and this is ultimate power over her. The curtain is the only way the Duke can control her now, now that she's gone, revealing his dominant nature. All of this is about what he reveals about himself. I mean, you could argue, and it's good to come up with alternative interpretations, that the memory of her is just all so painful for him to bear. And I don't like to look at it. It brings me to tears and it reminds me of her and how wonderful our marriage was. And that I'm a really sensitive soul. But we know this probably Probably isn't true or really definitely isn't true but it's worth um, you know having an alternative anyway um, sir it was not her husband's presence only so it wasn't just me there that called that spot of joy onto the duchess's cheek so the spot of joy as discussed in the previous video is a blush or a flush of some kind um, so it's a spontaneous reaction a blush there's nothing you can do about it and it's not something that she can control so this shows how this is unreasonable expectations of her. That's what I wrote earlier. But actually, I'd go further than that now. And I think it's actually a tyranny over her emotions, really, um, that it wasn't just me that called that spot of joy onto her Dutch, onto the Duchess's cheek. Perhaps Fra Pandolf, the artist, chanced to say while he was painting her, remember, oh, her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half flush that dies along her throat. Um, so these are two compliments, really. Um, interesting verb choice here, dies, though, um, the half flush that dies along her throat. Um, this is an interesting and sinister verb choice, and it's foreshadowing her eventual fate, really. Um, such stuff, such compliments as these here, such stuff was courtesy, she thought. I think this is an arrogant tone. This gives away his arrogance. It dismisses as stuff, actually a compliment. You know what? Um, such compliments, he might have said, but he's just dismissively said stuff. Such stuff is the... Um, is the, the arrogant way that he's describing a compliment. Such stuff was courtesy, she thought, and cause enough of calling up that spot of joy. She had a heart, how shall I say, and he's troubling 
he, he's struggling here to articulate himself. But how shall I say, too soon made glad, too easily impressed. Now, when I look at that, I think if you've got a heart that's soon made glad and easily impressed, that's not a bad thing. That means that you are somehow... Um, you know, a positive person if you're soon made glad, if you're easily impressed. And these adverbs demonstrate that the soon and easily show a positive, happy woman. However, the adverbs too easily and too soon repeated betray his tyranny over her emotions again. She is too soon made glad, too easily impressed. He shouldn't be the one to judge when she's made glad or how easily she's impressed. It should be down to her, but he has total control over her, or he wants it at this point at least. Um, so she liked whatever she looked on. Um, you know, she's curious and she does like whatever she looks on. Her looks went everywhere. And so, you know, we might think from that that, yeah, she's a curious woman um, and that you might look everywhere and think, oh, that's nice. Oh, and so is that. Um, the Duke's implication, however, here is that she's got some kind of roving, amorous eye, that she somehow is a bit flirtatious with her looks going everywhere. And this really betrays and unmasks his misunderstanding of what is probably her curious nature. Um, well, sir, he goes on to say, it was all one. All these things are the same, he's saying. My favour at her breast, the dropping of the daylight in the west. So he's saying that my place in her heart, in her emotions, my place in her emotions was the same as the dropping of the daylight, of the sunset in the West. And this is interesting because we've united these two with this um, rhyming couplet. They're all rhyming couplets, by the way. But here, um, his place in her heart is united and dovetailed with the dropping of the day, of the death of the day. And so I think that, that you can draw some significance from that. The Duke's implication is that he should produce more emotion than a beautiful sunset. But alternatively, this rhyming couplet aligns her ending of days, her sunset, with his presence, his presence at her breast and the ending of her day, the ending of her life. So this could be seen as a figurative sunset. Um, the bough, that is the branch of cherries, that some officious fool and again, there's this arrogant, dismissive tone here, trivialising um, a genuine gift like a bough of cherries that some officious fool gave. Um, you know, this isn't some and officious fool. This is a genuine gift, perhaps. And he has just trivialised it, just like he did up here with this arrogant tone. He's betraying himself as a bit of an ass. Um, and so we move on up to the next half of the poem. Um, also, the white mule skipping up here that she rode around the terrace uh, rode around rode with around the terrace all and each they're all the same remember would draw from her alike the approving speech yes i love it you can imagine her saying or blush at least and she thanked men good isn't that a bit condescending she thanked men good aren't you good um and so i think that this is the duke positioning himself as an important teacher figure and her as just a child or a kid or a pupil good seems like praise for just a little youngster um how condescending this man is he's giving it all away to us readers and also to the envoy um, she thanked men, good, but thanked somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a 900 years old name with anybody's gift. The repetition of gift here is um, significant because the Duke's sense of self-importance is revealed with his egotistical view of his own name, that my name is a gift and you will appreciate it more than you would anything else that any other man might make you smile with. He goes on to say, who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Even had you skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such a one. Now he's saying here that I'm not very good at communicating, um, which makes you hate him even more. He's a deceitful liar because these are 28 heroic couplets. All of this poem is made up, let me just focus on that, all of these are rhyming couplets, there are 28 of them. This is somebody who's extremely good with speech, um, so don't say 
even had you skill in speech, which I have not. When you are using 28 heroic couplets, iambic pentametric couplets, rhymed, um, this is skill in speech I've written here, maybe um, inappropriately that I hate him. But really, um, when you have iambic pentameters um, in rhyming couplets, you call them heroic couplets. And he's good at this. Um, anyway, which I have not, I don't have, he's lying, to make your will quite clear to such an one and say, just this or that in you disgusts me. Or here you miss and there you exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened so. So again, you've got this interesting verb choice, lessened so. This unmasks again his schoolmaster tone, betraying his view of her as just a kid. Um, nor plainly set her wits to yours, forsooth and made excuse, even then would be some stooping. So he's saying pretty much that if um, if I could teach her, then that would be stooping. So although he's got this schoolmaster tone, yeah, good, and down here, and, you know, um, she, if she let herself be lessened so, he chooses not to teach her anyway. He said, um, I choose never to stoop, that despite his teacher-like tone, he refuses to teach her. Um, I've put teaching in, in, in speech marks here because it's not really teaching. He would just be telling her off, um, that he is of obviously giving away how uncompromising he is and how he considers her so much lower than he is um, with this stooping that he would have to do, that he's not going to do. Oh, sir, she smiled, no doubt, whenever I passed her. So she does her duty, you might imagine, from his point of view. But who passed without much the same smile? So, you know, you want, um, you want, Mr. Duke, a special smile just for you. Is that right? Well, this grew. I gave commands. Then all smiles stopped together. There she stands, as if alive. Very short phrases here. Elsewhere, we've had long, extended, complex sentences. Here, significantly, we've got some very short, clinical, um, snappy sentences. These short, clinical phrases, for once, representing how she is shortly dismissed. She is just dispatched of, like a short sentence. Um, will it please you to rise? So, you know, this is speaking to the envoy again now, um, as he has been all the way through, I should say. But um, it reminds us that he's there here and he was told to sit down earlier. Now he's told to stand up. Um, and, you know, if he's been sitting down throughout this whole poem and this whole story, then you could imagine that the Duke has a psychological and physical edge speaking down um, to the envoy, speaking down, stooping almost to him. Um, so I've written here that the whole story is delivered down to the envoy, giving the Duke a physical and psychological power. Classic interview technique. Um, so we'll meet the company below then. I repeat, the Count, your master's known munificence, is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry be disallowed. Basically, this suggests that, yes, I will take the money that comes with that woman the daughter of the Count. Yes, I will take the money. Though his fair daughter's self, as I avowed at starting, is my object. So really, he's more interested in her, the possession of possibly the next Duchess. Um, this depersonalizes the next Duchess um, clearly with um, the possessive pronoun my and the objectification that comes with object, making her to just another of his possessions, almost like another artwork that he might later put into another frame. And you could imagine here the envoy saying, you go, you go first, you're the Duke. But then the Duke um, just out loud saying, nay, we'll go together down, sir. Notice Neptune, though, taming a seahorse. Thought a rarity, which Clouds of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. Um, and so this statue seems to reaffirm the Duke's dominance over beauty with force, that it almost represents the way that he has um, betrayed himself to be. I think this is an interesting last phrase, though, which Clouds of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. I think this is slightly ambiguous because, firstly, the statue is bronze and it illustrates the Duke's power figuratively. Yeah. Um, so this statue represents him. But actually, you could take this in a different way and you could take it more literally. Um, and that Clouds of Innsbruck actually cast 
in bronze for me as if he is the um, more direct Neptune figure, more literally bronze for me, um, giving him a metallic, hard and unchanging edge. So I know that was a bit of a race through. Um, and what I'll do is upload this onto OneNote. And also I will just pause it just there if you feel like you want to. Um, hopefully you've got some decent annotations. And now looking at the B side of this poem, um, which I did earlier over, where is it, here. I'm just going to race through some of this stuff. Um, and I think you can pause it if you like. Um, there is the context. Um, I'll just explain it and read it really quickly. So Robert Browning was one of the most famous Victorian poets. He was inspired by the Romantics as a child and tried to emulate their style. Um, he married an already famous poet called Elizabeth Barrett. Um, she became then Elizabeth Barrett Browning, and together they moved to Italy, living in Pisa and Florence. Robert Browning was fascinated with Italian history, art and culture. Um, it was popular in Victorian times, actually, for lots of Victorian gentlemen, um, which influenced many of his poems. My Last Duchess is inspired, actually, um, as you might remember from the other video, by a real Duke of Ferrara who lived from 1533 to 97 from northern Italy, from Ferrara. Um, he placed great honour in the fact that he could trace his family home um, family name back to the year 940. He had a short marriage with Lucrezia de' Medici, famous family, until her life ended after less than three years. Some believe her death was a suspicious one. Either way, he remarried two more times. Um, Browning invents the two Renaissance sounding artists to include in his poem who were not real. This is the name dropping part um, and bringing us back to the Victorian era and Robert Browning's time. Um, it was a more progressive time than the Renaissance for sure in terms of women's rights, but it was still hugely unequal. Um, women couldn't vote. They rarely owned property, and only in late Victorian times did women's suffrage become more prominent. So Browning is arguably using this poem um, to criticise contemporary Victorian values, his own um, society's Victorian values, by foregrounding the objectification and dominance over women, because there was still a long way to go, and actually you might argue there still is. Form and structure. This is um, including some of the stuff that we touched on in an earlier video. Um, I'm not going to read this about the dramatic monologue. You've already got this written down from yesterday's video. However, we've got a couple of other little bits to touch on. Um, the poem is made up of 28 heroic couplets, um, like, for, for example, wall and call, hands and stands. It goes on and on. Um, and this shows, I think it's important to come up with some significance for it. This shows the forcing together of lines representing the Duke's possessiveness and rigid control of forcing together um, people. Enjambment, too, is common throughout the poem, perhaps betraying the Duke's inability to have total control or his desire to appear fluent and a pretense of amiability. So, you know, um, that he does fail to have total control, um, possibly, but actually it also makes it seem more conversational and it makes him um, able to appeal more to the, um, the envoy. And this book ending or narrative framing, we should say, the book end in the poem are two artworks which the Duke uses to contrive an elevated position over his listeners. I've actually put the S in brackets there because he has a listener in the poem, of course, but you too are a listener. Um, this is reinforced with a sit down stand up, as he tells and reveals his story. Um, he looks down on the listener. This narrative framing neatly illustrates his dominance. Um, and over here um, we have some themes. There's control and dominance because the Duke feels the need totally to have total control over the Duchess and stops at nothing to achieve this. Class and status. Um, that the Duke's rank and wealth are used to elevate him over others, especially the envoy. Arrogance and self-importance that the poem is all about me, I, I, me. Imagine him with an Instagram account with the focus throughout being the Duke and his influence and his power and his possessions and objectification. 
and patriarchy. Um, the, the Duke clearly objectifies women, both the last Duchess and even the possible next Duchess. Even the painting has a value worth commenting on and pride and power. That is that the Duke um, seems so very satisfied with himself and his achievements. He has complete power over those all around him. So many of those overlap and you may well think of some more to put in there and that's fine. Other notes, just here I have the vocab um, that we discussed in the previous video um, and some quote explosions just very quickly. I'll just focus on this top one. You can choose whichever ones you like, but I've actually chosen. Um, that's my last Duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. And I've actually gone to town with some annotations on that. And finally, um, I've also got some more detailed annotations or a quote explosion for this. This grew, I gave commands and all smiles stopped together. So you can pause it on those and copy or you can choose your own. Finally, some comparison ideas. This isn't an exhaustive list and you might have others and other ways of comparing these same poems. But Ozymandias, we've got ideas about total control over others used for selfish and hubristic gains. Just like Ozymandias, the, um, the Duke does this. Kamikaze, that is the the abuse of control over others and the manipulation of individuals and their lives to gain um, and checking out the history is similar really but the suppressing of identity by a questionable higher power that proves either in my last duchess to be insurmountable or in checking out my history something to expose and surmount um, it's a positive ending at checking out my history this is a negative ending here london um, so the power over individuals that both both the poems expose um, control. Now, London does it ideologically um, and socially. Um, and here in My Last Duchess, it does it patriarchally. But both are a kind of call to arms for change that the poets use these poems to try to bring about some um, change and raise consciousness to try art itself actually is to raise consciousness rather than for its own sake you might argue the prelude which we haven't studied yet um, but we will be coming soon um, this is a contrast really on how powerful forces either need to be framed as in my last duchess and tamed or in the prelude feared and acknowledged as awe-inspiring um, and giving a sense of sublime and remains finally here contrasting how the guilt over violence and the violent actions is either internalized as in remains remember he began um shooting the looter when there were three of them but he ended up internalizing and isolating the guilt as just his um and actually you could also ignore as my last duchess does the violent actions and just present it as entirely reasonable um so there's some interesting mileage with all of those and others um so i hope that that's helped a little bit and i'm hoping also that you have something with lots of pauses and writing down um that looks like that um and just to let you know that both the annotations and this sheet here uh, on one note for you to copy down. Well done and thank you. That's the end of this week's lessons.